Let us go to God in prayer. Lord God, our Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who brought the kingdom to us. We thank you for your word read to us, which tells us of your kingdom and what it is like. As we reflect on the words together, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Last week, we looked at knowing who and whose we are as we live in this world. Knowing who and whose we are will allow us to stay steadfast to the Lord and not get pulled away into the ways of the world. It is the ways of the kingdom of heaven that we want to follow as disciples of Jesus Christ. What would it be like for us to walk in kingdom ways? In order to answer that question, we need to look at what the kingdom of heaven is like. Some of you may remember, most may not, that in 2005, there was a movie that came out called Kingdom of Heaven. It was historical fiction set in late 12th century Palestine, the time between the second and third crusades in the Holy Land. The Christians ruled Jerusalem and the king was Baldwin IV. He had a vision for peace, a kingdom of heaven, if you will, which unfortunately was not fulfilled. He had leprosy and he died before he could take that further. The kingdom of heaven shown in that movie was one that was guarded by military might engaged in battles to defend this kingdom of heaven, which was also a geographical location, Jerusalem and the areas around it. When we read about kingdoms in history, we will find images of battles, of medieval opulence, of warriors, pomp, ceremony. And so it is not surprising that those through the ages who have tried to set up Christian kingdoms in times past saw the kingdom of heaven on those same terms. However, when we read the Gospels, we find a completely different picture of kingdom. The kingdom of heaven brought by Jesus does not consist of armies and territories. Dallas Willard, professor of philosophy and author of The Divine Conspiracy in that book, defines kingdom as a place where a person's choice determines what happens. In other words, it is where a person's will is effective. And as such, you and I have our kingdoms where what we decide, what we choose, takes hold. If so, then the kingdom of heaven is the place where God's choices or God's will determines what happens in that realm. The kingdom of heaven is not a geographical territory with visible might and power. Rather, this is the realm where God's decision determines what happens and it is found in the hearts of men and women who have chosen to follow Jesus. It is found in communities of these men and women who have come together as God's people. 
In the Gospel reading today, Jesus gives us several images of the Kingdom of Heaven to help us see what it is like. The first two, do they surprise you the first time you read it? For a kingdom, a place where God rules, we would hardly expect, perhaps, or think that it would be small. Small like a mustard seed small like a bit of yeast mixed into a large batch of dough for baking. Our God seems to have preference most times for beginning small and then working quietly and steadily until that work takes effect and its influence is felt far and wide. Look at how he began the nation of Israel, with one man, Abraham. Look at how he inaugurated the kingdom of heaven, not with a big parade or with a mighty army sweeping into town, but with one man gathering 12 others around him to be with him and to teach them the ways of the kingdom. Our Lord Jesus and his 12 disciples. After 2,000 years, the effect is seen and felt worldwide, even in places which are hostile to the kingdom. And in fact, these are the places where God's people are growing more rapidly than in other places. The seed grows into a tree, the yeast has made the whole lump of dough rise. In recent times, or at least in the latter half of last century into this century, we see God at work in the same way with the church in China. When all the missionaries were expelled from China in the early 1950s, no one gave the church in China any hope of surviving. How could that church, so weak, no resources almost, because they had mostly depended on resources from foreign missionaries in China, they had no strong leadership, how would they survive? In the next 30 years after that, nothing more was heard of the church in China. No one knew what happened to the Christians in that period. Then China opened its doors in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Mission agencies the world over were stunned to find that those few hundred thousand, what they considered weak Christians that they had left behind had grown to over millions of Christians, strong in their faith, having weathered persecution in those times. Christians in China today number more than a hundred million. But that number could be very much higher because there are unofficial churches that meet underground. A weak beginning. But with God at work, the kingdom effect turned out to be enormous, tremendous. Quite a number of us have been to mission schools. And some of us may find similar things happening with the lives of those of our friends who attended these schools. I remember one Easter service in Kampa. There was this man who had come to join us. We were in the open air. He wore a clerical collar and I wondered what he was doing with us. And after service, one of the church members who had been this man's teacher introduced us. And after that, this church member commented that this guy had never shown interest in the Christian faith in school, even though he had heard the gospel. 
And then this man went over to the United Kingdom to continue his studies. And it was there that the gospel preached that word said here in Kampa bore fruit, leading him to become a Christian and then to dedicate his life to serving the church full time as a pastor. Small beginnings in a small town with far reaching effects. What would these images then mean for disciples of Jesus Christ? Kingdom ways. First, it would be patience when we undertake to minister in the name of Jesus. We may not begin with a bang, and sometimes it may just be one person or one family to whom we minister. But God takes that and he uses it to expand the reach of his kingdom to bring in others. Perhaps some of us have that experience as well. The only Christian in the family and yet through our testimony and faith, many members of our family have come to faith. Secondly, with God, small actions can mean much when we follow his lead and put ourselves into doing what he invites us to. We may only be able to pray, not more than that, but God hears those prayers. And sometimes we may not even know how to pray. The Holy Spirit hears and takes that and groans for us, teaches us to pray. And that prayer has far-reaching effects. Thirdly, the signs of God's kingdom can be found in the ordinary things of life. Very often, we may think that, oh, in order to know God, to see God, it must be something spectacular or at least out of the ordinary. But that would leave a large portion of our life out of God or at least not connected with God. God is in the ordinary things of life. And that is how Jesus would always point the people to. Do we keep our eyes open for God in our daily life. Because of these small beginnings, it would be so easy for us to dismiss the kingdom of heaven as unimportant or of little value. So people don't think much, for example, of a Christian manager who gives up on a promotion in order to continue to have direct contact and share life with the operators in his unit in the family, in, in the factory, rather than move up the chain and rub shoulders with a small number of the prominent people, the directors and so on. Or people may shake their heads, for example, at someone who gives up a senior post in a company to become a homemaker so that children can be given a good education and brought up in the ways of the kingdom with God. Jesus now gives us two more images to blow away this kind of thinking that the kingdom is of little value. These two images tell us that we would be foolish to think that the smallness of the beginning of the kingdom renders it unimportant. These two images draw on the fact that the kingdom is so valuable that we would be foolish if we do not go after it with everything we have. The first picture Jesus gives is of treasure buried in a field. Someone who is in the field stumbles upon the treasure perhaps uncovered by rain, uh, washing the soil away. Perhaps this person was working on the land for the owner, a renter or a laborer. He comes upon the treasure, 
realizes its worth, buries it again to keep it safe. And Jesus tells us he's so joyful at discovering the treasure that he goes out, he sells all that he has in order to buy over that field. Having bought that field, the treasure then becomes his. What this man gets is many, many, many times more than what he gave up selling all that he had. The second picture that Jesus gives is that of a pearl, a priceless pearl. What do you think is the price of the most expensive pearl in the world today? I, as usual, asked Google and in uh, the Forbes magazine, 2016, there was an article that gave information on a pearl that was discovered off the Philippine island of Palawan in 2006. That pearl is 26 inches high, 12 inches in width, and weighs nearly 75 pounds, valued at 100 million US dollars. And so this image that Jesus gives, a merchant of precious stones looking for that one pearl of great value. And when he finds it, he, like that laborer in the field, goes and sells everything he has in order to get that one priceless pearl. Many, many more times valuable than what he has sold. Each of us has something that is extremely valuable to us and for which we would be willing to give up what we have. Sometimes everything, like the two persons in the parables, in order to get hold of it. If you remember the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told his disciples that their hearts would be where their treasure is, not the other way around, that the treasure is where the heart is. It is when we have set a value on something, when we see something as important and valuable, that we will put our heart in it, that we will chase after it. An example, Jacob. Look at him. He loved Rachel. He was willing to give seven years of his life working for Laban so that he could have Rachel as his wife. And we were told, when we are told, uh, the person who wrote this story tells us that the seven years seemed like only a few days because of his love for her. Very obvious what Jacob's treasure was and where his heart was. And then on the wedding day, he gets cheated by Laban and is stuck with Leah, the one he doesn't love. In his love for Rachel, Jacob is willing to work for another seven more years to have her, even though it cost him his freedom another seven years. It, that freedom was not too precious to give up so that he could have Rachel as his wife. With these two images, Jesus is telling his disciples, he's telling us that in embracing God's rule, the kingdom of heaven, the disciples have gained, we have gained so much more than what we give up in order to be in the kingdom. And then Jesus adds one more image to the rest. The kingdom of heaven is like a net catching all kinds of fish that are sorted out at the end of the day. The good being kept, the bad thrown away. If you remember the parable of the wheat and the weeds last week, 
has an echo to this. This last, last image comes like that parable of the wheat and the weeds as a warning. Earth and life as we know it now will one day come to an end. When that day comes, where each person ends up, will depend on whether they have embraced the kingdom of heaven or not. We need to ask, what is so valuable about the kingdom of heaven that I would give up everything I have in order to obtain it? What is so valuable about having God rule my life that I would give up everything to be under this rule? And I would invite us to think carefully and thoroughly of these two questions. Dallas Willard, again, the late Dallas Willard, in another book, The Renovation of the Heart, defines love as the will to good or benevolence. That is, we love something or someone when we promote their good for their own sake. This definition takes us beyond that warm, fuzzy, lovey-dovey feeling that we normally associate with love. This definition concerns our will, the will to act for the good of someone. And Dallas Willard continues to note that the, this characterizes the deepest essence of God, this will to good. Remember, John tells us God is love in his first epistle. The reading from Romans chapter 8 this morning helps us to see this will to good. This is then also the essence of the kingdom of heaven, of God's rule. In his rule, God seeks the good of those who belong to him, who love him. Whatever the life situation we're in, whether it be pleasant times or difficult and dark times, God is at work and God is able to work in such ways that it turns out for our good. And what is this good? This good is to become more and more like Jesus Christ, to be forgiven, to be healed and remade in the image of Jesus Christ, which is the very image of God. It is to be enabled to live the life that he has given us to the fullest. And this was the original purpose for which God created us. Only in the kingdom of heaven, only when we live in the kingdom of heaven, can this happen. And this is what makes the kingdom of heaven valuable. This will to good is most prominently demonstrated on the cross. While God seeks our good, the love that he has for us is also a holy love. And therefore, he cannot just close his eyes and say, I forgive you your sin. It doesn't work that way. Sinners cannot approach God either. If we do, we would be consumed. And so God, the only one who could do something about it, did. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, as Paul puts it. And if you remember when we looked at chapter 5 in Romans, Paul writes even more precisely that God demonstrates his own love, this will to good for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. You and I were condemned to die because of sin. Christ died in our place. 
we deserve judgment and punishment because of our sin. Christ took it for us so that we may live with God. Jesus continues to love us. Jesus continues to seek our good interceding at God's right hand. And we saw that a little bit on Ascension Sunday when we become the subject of conversation between God and Jesus. If we think, a reminder, if we think no one would care enough to pray for us, there is one person who is interceding for us and it is Jesus Christ our Lord. Because it is God who made that choice to love us and God doesn't change, we have the confidence as Paul did that nothing can separate us from this love of God. Paul lists a whole host of circumstances and entities and events that could potentially draw us away from God. Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, even being killed. And for some people, these may have led to a loss of faith. And yet, all of these things cannot stop God from loving us and seeking our good cannot separate us from the love of God. And because of this, we can overcome more than overcome. We can thrive and flourish because of God's love. All of us are at different places in our faith journey, in our relationship with God. Some of us, may be asking if following Jesus is worth it. We may have given up friends to follow Jesus. And some people have. I have had people who share with me that, you know, um, they don't go as often with their friends anymore because of the way the friends behave and the things they do. Good friends that, that they had before they became Christians. It may have cost us much to follow Jesus. We are invited to trust in the love of God that seeks our good, the love that makes the rule of God, his kingdom, something so valuable that it far outweighs all we have given up to follow him. Some of us may wonder if the ministries we engage in will bear fruit and whether our effort has any value in adding to this ministry. Some wonder if God is there in our lives or the lives of the people for whom we have prayed. Those of us in these situations are invited to look at the image of the mustard seed and that little bit of yeast, and to trust that God is at work even when we don't see any visible signs of him at work. And so brothers and sisters in Christ and all who are following this, welcome to the kingdom of heaven. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, we thank you that your ways of working are so different from the ways of the world. And your ways, the ways of the kingdom of heaven, are ways that work, that work for eternity. And we thank you for opening the kingdom of heaven to us, for Jesus bringing this kingdom near to us. And so some of us may be wrestling with following Jesus. Some of us may be wrestling with our ministries. And if we are in these situations, let me invite us to place ourselves and our work 
and our ministry in God's hands and come to know that whatever we have given up for God is worth it. Our Father, we thank you that you see every effort, you see our hearts. And so we pray that you will continue to teach us, to minister to us as we move into the coming week, that we may see you in the ordinary routines of life, for that is always where you are to be found. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.